term, ePortfolio. How many of you have been tasked with creating an ePortfolio, right? How many of you, if someone comes to you and says, you know, we really need to think about ePortfolios, right? That's when, like, the clouds come over, and everyone's like, what? What is it for? How do we do it? Can we use Blackboard? How do we do it? Is it for assessment? Do we have to rethink it? Well, we didn't ever come to ePortfolios like that. What we found is that students like Robert Lynn, who's an art student, created their own ePortfolio. They went out there and they said, look, I have a lot of great art to share. Let me build a site and show it. And the professors would come to it and say, wow, this is amazing. I'm glad you chose this work. Why did you choose this work over that? And the conversation happened organically around the site between a student and a professor. The ePortfolio came out of the logic that publishing was easy. Publishing was really simple. So that's really where that started. We also have research sites. I come from Fredericksburg, Virginia. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Fredericksburg, Virginia had two major battles during the Civil War in the US. The Civil War is a current event in Fredericksburg, Virginia. It's always happening. It's eternal. I can't escape it. Well, given that, Virginia is pretty crazy about their historical markers. Right? They have them all over the place. Everywhere you turn, there's a historical marker. Well, our students went out and they created a resource site. They actually documented these historical markers, they wrote about them, and then they offered a bibliography. What we found is that this is one of the most trafficked sites on the UMW blogs. The research this, this class did for, this, these students did for a class, is something that the community is constantly turning to and using. And why? Because it's open and it's accessible, and when you search it on Google, it's the third hit. That makes a difference. We have another site created by Marjorie Arc. Her and her professor, her and her students created an exhibit about Venice, Italy, talking about the art and architecture of Venice. It's only been up for about four months. Already that has been hit 80,000 times. It's getting all sorts of traffic. People are giving all sorts of feedback. That can't happen in a closed system. You can't have not only the searchability, but also the accessibility and the ability for people to come in and join the conversation. And this stuff is about conversation. So, we're using it for departmental sites. This is a quick way for departments to update news, also give them an RSS feed. Clubs and organizations are telling you the student life has, this has changed in some ways how I imagine student life because we couldn't see any of it before. But a lot of it now is visible through our system. And they're doing it. No one said to do this. No professor has to do this. No student has to do this. They're willingly doing it. And to me, that's the difference. And they have all these crazy club blogs that we're just aggregating into one space. Presentation sites, people are using it for that all the time. Just a quick way, like I'm doing with UMW blogs for this. Just a quick way to get the resources out there. Media. We have a bunch of media on campus that we have to imagine how we're going to present it. Well, with UFW blogs now, with this application, we have our own broadcasting space. We can include video, we can include audio, we can do a ton of stuff, and it costs us next to nothing. I mean, that's the big question is, how much does this cost us? Well, we externally host it, right? We built the application, it's open source. It cost us for the first year $30 a month. I mean, it's killing us, right? 30 bucks a month, that's like, that's like almost $400,000 a year. I mean, $400,000 a year to give over 1,000 people web access and sites. Although, don't be confused, because that's the technical cost. The cost really comes in people and jobs. You give people jobs to work with your faculty and your students to reimagine the space. You invest the money in people, not in technology. Well, it's gotten bigger. We went to a dedicated server, so the expense is doubled. No, actually, they more than double. They went up 10 times. It's now $300 a month. So it comes in at under $4,000 a year. But the fact is, the cost and the price is really in people. It's really in my group and our a group of people who are working with faculty directly to reimagine this stuff. And that's really where it happens. It's a personal relationship around ideas. And it's the idea of talking, and the conversation is always about what should I do? Should I make this open? What are the implications? Because anyone on the system can close it. 
But it's a fact that we can have a conversation. We can talk about what it means to be open and what are the implications. That changes it, right? There's no magic recipe. The, the idea is like everything we deal with. It's a, it's a conversation between people about an idea. And the idea right now that's hot and needs to be thought about is whether to make it open. Why would we make it open? What do you have to benefit from? Well, I think the question is, these faculty are benefiting unbelievably because they're presenting more than they've ever presented before. They're doing more work and getting recognized for it than they ever have before. And they also have students who are engaged to do it because they know it moves outside the classroom. Right? It's an amazing thing. I want to talk about another example. The Literary Journals Project is amazing. We have, we have a, a class that's been going on for three years where they actually produce a literary journal in 15 weeks. And they do it all with WordPress. And it's an amazing project. We have an open journal now on Emily Dickinson and HD that these students have created and are publishing. We have a museum. I can talk about the Internet Archive. I can also talk about mobile press and how convenient that is. But I think today in my workshop, I'm going to talk a little bit about a project that's going on up at UBC. It's by Professor John Beasley Murray. And one of the things he did, when we think about access and open, how many of you have ever heard of a site called Wikipedia? <laughs> right? Yeah. It's huge. It's like YouTube. Well, this professor actually decided that over the course of the semester, he was going to have his students either create or clean up 12 articles on Wikipedia. And the goal was to get them featured. Now, to get an article featured on Wikipedia is extremely difficult. It has to go through this kind of standards test. And it's like 0.1% of all articles, of all the millions of articles on there get featured. Well, out of the 12, we got five featured in this class. And the process through which they brought the research they were doing in the library, they brought the work and labor they were doing over the course of time into a very public and open setting. And what it did is it kind of created some amazing articles with some unbelievable research and resources. If you see El Señor Presidente, right, a famous, a famous novel, well, if you look at that site and read that Wikipedia page, you'll see that a lot of the blood, sweat, and tears was from a group of students from the University of British Columbia. And they took it as a kind of sense of not only doing this, but doing it openly and giving back. And what's amazing is the professor talked about how different his students' approach was to this project. Because they knew it was going to echo in some kind of internet eternity. Right? It wasn't going to die on the floor. It wasn't going to be one thing I give to one professor and then it's gone. It was going to be a kind of larger notion of openness. And I don't think openness has to come in a kind of predefined package. I don't think it has to be open courseware. I don't think it has to be any one notion or any one technology. Openness can come through so many different ways. It's at its heart a relationship and a community. And it's a personal one and it's a communal one. And it's through that, something like, like you have here, that openness can take off. That can happen. And how it will benefit you is it will allow you and your kind of university to reimagine what you do here as some kind of larger notion of what we all do together. And no longer are you kind of trapped by the space and place of buildings and classes. But what you do, in essence, echoes in some sort of informational determinant. Now, how we archive that, how we deal with that, how we make sense of all that, well, that's what we're here for. That's why universities are important. Right? That's why we stay and battle on. So I think I'm out of time, but I want to thank you all. And I want to have questions, but I was way too late. All right, thank you.